Hello, folks. Take me down, please. Wow, I'm loud. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Hey, I'm Eric. I'm your president, and I want to touch bases with you real quick. We have uh, three great presenters today. We've got Diane Belt, Adrian Wilkes, and uh, Richard Hornick. Hobernick, excuse me. Once again, I've butchered his name. I will never be able to look him in the face again in public. Uh, so I want to alert you to a couple future programs. Uh, next week we have uh, State Treasurer Ted Wheeler. After that we have Chris Anderson, who again is the publisher of The Oregonian. Uh, I believe that on the 11th is a holiday that we will not convene. And on November 18th, we've got Ellen Rosenblum, who's our Attorney General. That's our upcoming speaker slate. And I want to thank uh, John McWilliams, Kathy Stanton, uh, and others for booking. Uh, they do a lot of work on the phones behind the scenes. Uh, with that being said, I'd like uh, to ask you to put your hands together for some applause for uh, Mr. Hobernick and crew. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting us to the Public Affairs Forum. My name is Rich Hobernick, and I'm your assessor, tax collector, and county clerk for Washington County. With me today is Adrian Wilkes, our residential appraisal supervisor, and uh, Diane Belt, our tax collections supervisor. And this is the agenda that we'll be following today. We'll discuss how uh, values are assessed in the tax process. I will first explain the role of our department in the uh, process. Our department's responsible for uh, valuing about 211,000 property accounts with a real market value of $76 billion. We calculate and collect over $877 million in taxes on behalf of the 49 taxing districts. Uh, we also do other things other than just assessment and uh, taxation in our department. We also have a recording division. We record over uh, 100,000 uh, land-based documents a year. And we're also responsible for managing the elections process in the county. We have 286,000 registered voters. I will now turn the presentation over to Adrian, and she'll discuss how values are assessed. Thank you. So before I start talking about how values are assessed, I think it's important to have a little bit of a historical perspective of where we, how we got to this um, system of Oregon property tax system that we currently operate under. We actually operate under two different, different measures that were uh, voter passed initiatives. The first one is Measure 5. Measure 5 basically established a real market value um, and a tax limit based on that real market value. That tax limit was $5 per thousand for schools and ten dollars per thousands for general um, for general government, and then and as a result of the uh, property taxes increasing, as a result of in the early 90s, Oregon was fortunate enough to have a pretty robust real estate market, and market values were climbing. And as a result of that, and because taxes were based on that real market value, taxes just kept climbing. And so the voters were unhappy with the amount of increase that was going on in their property taxes. So they passed um, a measure called Measure, for, it started off as more Measure 47, but became Measure 50 when it was actually uh, passed. That measure basically is known as a cut, cap, and rollback. And what that did was it did, um, one, one of the things it did was it established a maximum assessed value. And that maximum assessed value can only go up by statute by 3% per year. So before I go in, what I want to go over next is um, some definitions, because I've actually thrown quite a bit at you as far as real market value, maximum assessed value, assessed value, and all of these values have a different meaning to them. So if I can, I'd like to go through some definitions with you. So what is real market value? Real market is, value is actually defined by statute, and it is the price that your property, uh, you, that you could sell your property for in an arm's length transaction w between a willing buyer and a willing seller on January 1st of each year. That is the assessment date, each year. So um, the one aspect of this that can be somewhat uh, tri kind of tricky is, well, so what is an arm's length transaction? 
So sometimes it's easiest to explain what is not an arm's length transaction than what actually is an arm's length transaction. So let me give you some examples. So one of the examples is I want to purchase my home from, or purchase my mother's home. Or I want to purchase my, a home from my brother or an aunt or a grandmother. Those are, um, would not be viewed typically as an arm's length transaction um, because it's between family members. Or let's say that I'm a tenant in an office building and I want to purchase that office building actually. Um, many times that's not considered an arm's length transaction because it's never actually exposed to, the, the, to the, um, all of the uh, market participants. So um, those are just some general ideas of what kind of is not an arm's length transaction. So now let me talk about maximum assessed value that was established under Measure 50. So Measure 50 established the um, maximum assessed value, and that maximum assessed value was based on, in 1997, based on your real market value in 1995, less 10%. Therefore, there's the rollback. Um, and under Measure 50, again, that value can never go up by more than 3% by statute. Okay. Now where some confusion comes in is because many times people use these interchangeably, maximum assessed value and assessed value. They are two distinct and different values. So the assessed value really is the easiest of the values to explain because it is the lower of your real market value or your maximum assessed value. And the other thing is that on your assessed value, that is actually what your taxes are based off of. So now I want to talk about, remember I said that values couldn't go up, your maximum assessed value couldn't go up by more than 3%, except, and so there is um, provisions in the uh, statutes that allow for an increase in your maximum assessed value as a result of certain typical things that may occur to the property. Some of these might be, for example, a new property. You build a new house. Obviously, that's exception value. So let's say, though, you want to do that new improvement to your property, like you want to put that addition on, or you finally are going to do that remodel that your wife has been wanting for so long, or what about that man cave that you want to add? So those would be imp new improvements that would fall outside the, outside the maximum assessed value limit of 3%. Another example would be property that's partitioned. So I have a piece of property that I want to partition, and I actually am going to um, divide it up into 10 additional lots. Those are new properties and would, be, would basically get a new assessed value or a new maximum assessed value. Um, also one that is a little less known but um, also is quite, um, that, you know, it falls under the definition of exception value is um, re property that's been rezoned. So let's say I have a piece of property that gets annexed into the city and um, prior to annexation, it was zoned as just a single family, 5,000 square foot lot minimum. But when it get, actually got zoned or annexed into the city, they actually rezoned the property to multifamily. Now, the important distinction on rezoning is that it's not at the point in that the rezoning occurs, but in fact, it's when the actual improvement is uh, put on the property that is uh, a use consistent with the zoning. So in my example with the apartment, it would not be just the fact that the property got rezoned to be apartment land, but in fact that I actually went out there and built that apartment complex on that property. And at that point in time, that would be considered exception value. And lastly on my list here is the property that has been disqualified from exemption, partial exemption, or a special assessment. So the other um, provision to Measure 50 that, uh, um, that occurred was this, um, what is called the change property ratio. Because obviously all properties should have the same benefit under Measure 50 that a property that was built in 1995. So obviously if I have a home that was built in 2011, it wasn't in existence in 1995. So I need some way to be able to uh, provide that benefit of Measure 50 that uh, an established property would have. And the way we do that is through what is called the change property ratio. That ratio basically is by property class, so the, and it's calculated every year. And what I mean by a property class is really by a property grouping, such as residential or commercial, industrial, apartment, farm forest. Um, those types of properties and that, that change property ratio is calculated for each one of those property classes. And the way that is done is by taking the average maximum assessed value divided by the average real market value. 
So for example, in my example here this year, the change property ratio for residential properties was 82.2%. So in my example that I can give you is, let's, for the sake of ease, let's say I add a $100,000 home to the, to the tax roll. That $100,000, the maximum assessed value will be established at $82,200. So now I want to go through some graph, some graphic uh, display of how Measure Five and or Measure Fifty basically works. So I have two slides here: one for a typical, which is the majority of the properties within Washington County, and then I have a slide to show you the atypical. So if you'll notice on the slide here, the blue line is actually the real market value. The pink line is the maximum assessed value. And the um, assessed value is denoted by the green bars. So you'll notice that in 2005 and 6, when we had that big run-up in market values as a, as a result of the market values, just the market was really hot. The real estate market was really hot. And so as a result, we, you can see that gap between the real market value and the maximum assessed value just climbed. But you'll also notice in this graph that the assessed value just continued to tick along at, that, at the 3% with the maximum assessed value. And the reason for that is because of the part of measure 50 that says it's the lower of the real market value or your maximum assessed value. And so in this case, this property is being, um, the increase in the real market value is being tempered or the assessed value is being tempered by that maximum assessed value limit of 3%. Sorry. Um, so now let's look at the atypical property. This one is a little more complicated. So now let's look at this property and see. You'll see that we started off in, in the beginning with the real market value line above the maximum assessed value line. And you'll notice that the assessed value is, in fact, is tracking along with the maximum assessed value. So then all of a sudden, year 2008 occurs, and we see a downturn in the market. And in this case, on this property, that the maximum or that real market value actually fell below the maximum assessed value. Now remember, Measure 50 says that you will not pay more more than, or your assessed value will never be more than the maximum assessed value or the real market value, whichever is lower. So in this case, the real market value is actually becomes the assessed value. And then you can see as we, as we continue going along in 2009, 10. 11 and 12, that real market value is really what's driving the assessed value. And that's, again, the assessed value is what you actually pay taxes on. So now you're going to see in 2013, we've seen a, an increase in market values. Um, and so now as a result in this, in this example, and I want to point out that this is not a property. This is just a representation of a property. Um, and you can see here that the real market value actually now has popped up above that maximum assessed value pink line. So in this case, you can see where the assessed value now will be based on the maximum assessed value, and as a result, it will, in, it will be a larger increase than the 3% under statute. Because the statute does not say the assessed value cannot go up by more than 3%. It says the maximum assessed value cannot go up by more than 3%. And so that's, I just want to make that really clear because a lot of people get those, the assessed value and maximum assessed value, they use them interchangeably and they are two distinctly different values. So, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Diane and she's going to talk about how tax rates are uh, calculated and collected. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, once again, my name is Diane Belt, and I am the Tax Collection Supervisor. And thank you for inviting us today. It's really kind of good to get out and talk a little bit about, uh, hopefully, the tax bill you just got today or this afternoon. <laughs> so Adrian's done a really good job of explaining to you how your values are calculated. Now, what we do on the collection side or the tax administration side is we're going to take all of that information and then we're going to take some information that's provided to us by the 49 taxing districts and we're going to come up with this lovely tax bill. So 
the one thing that we need to remember is that Measure 50 actually established three types of categories. Uh, the first, or excuse me, uh, rates. And permanent rate is the rate that the district was given at the time Measure 50 was enacted. And that is a rate that the district cannot levy more than. It says that, you know, City of Banks, your permanent rate is $3.25 per thousand, and you can levy less, but you cannot levy more. If a district is looking for additional funds to support um, their business, they may go to the voters and ask for a local option levy. Now, local option levy can be three to five years in length, and it is voter approved. And the other thing that we have is our bonded debt, or our, our bonds. Those are unlimited. Those, uh, it's important to know that that's in an unlimited category because they're not subject to Measure 5 rules. So that would be kind of what we're looking at. And what we get from all of the districts by the 15th of July is actually called an LB50, ED50, or UR50. And that says, County Assessor, here's what um, I am legal to have you levy. And they give us that information, and that's what we input into our system. So, how are the rates calculated? Now, if you go out to our website, you can see what we have uh, published out there as a summary book, and that summary book is basically a collection of how every single um, district's rate was calculated. We actually published that on our website. The 1314 is not out there yet. We're working on it as quickly as we can, but that is kind of the Bible on uh, how the taxes were calculated. It'll uh, show you value in that particular district, show you the rates, it'll show you um, if there was an urban renewal involved. So there's a wealth of information in that book. It shows all the code areas. Uh, so if you ever want something to read some night when you can't sleep, you can get up and read our summary book. So let's talk about um, how the collection process works. Well, what we're going to do when we get all the information in our system, it's a really simple calculation. And all it is is the value times the rate equals the tax. The value's computed, um, the market value, but as Adrian explained, the AV, the maximum assessed, all of that is by statute. It's all calculated by statute. Your rates are all by statute or by voter approved levies. So everything we do is a calculation. So that, we take your um, value times the rate, you get the tax that's due, and then that's how we begin our process, and that should be reflected in the tax bill that you just received. So when you get your tax bill, which half of them were mailed Friday, and if you have a mortgage company, the rest of those will be mailed Wednesday. So you should have a surprise from us in the mail today if you don't have it already. So when you get your tax bill, it has a lot of information on it. Uh, the very top part of your tax bill is going to give you your map, the situs of your property, your account number, a brief legal description. It's also going to tell you what code area that you are in. It's going to give you information about last year's values versus this year's value. It's going to give you some important phone numbers to talk, uh, call if you have questions. And then we're going to outline on the left-hand side all of the taxing detail. So this is where all of your tax dollars went to. This is who you paid services to. Now one thing, and I brought uh, some extras here if people would like one, it's our, our insert. And the nice thing that we have in here now is kind of our glossary, because there's an awful lot of people, LOL is the biggest one people always call, is that laugh out loud or lots of luck? And no, it's local option levy. Uh, so we do have a little um, chart down on the bottom, and it's also out on our website. So that kind of helps you understand what you're paying towards. And all of our taxes are categorized <clears throat> by um, education category, which would be all of your education taxes, general government, and then at the bottom would be the unlimited, and that would be bonds and special assessments. So that's how they're categorized. And then it's going to tell you if you have any delinquent taxes, and it's also going to tell you what to pay with a discount, and then down here it's going to give you some options on payment. And on the back of the tax statement, there's also an awful lot of information that talks about your appeal rights, and it also talks about um, interest calculations and also the payment dates. 
And at any time, if you want to give us a call, if you don't understand what's on that tax bill, if you need help looking at it, please call us. We'd be more than happy to walk you through it. So the way our process works is it's kind of interesting in that the values that we use to calculate the tax are based on what your property was on January 1st of 2013. So by the time you get this tax bill, those values are about a year old. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. July 1st is actually the lien date for these taxes. So on July 1st, there was a statutory lien on your property for taxes. And this is important if you're buying or selling property and the title companies take care of that because to us, it's a lien on the property, not the people. Then on October 25th, that is our drop dead date for getting all tax bills in the mail. My understanding is most of the counties are mailing this week. So statewide, there's going to be an awful lot of mailboxes with these green tax statements. And the color of your tax statement makes a difference to us. If it's green, that tells me that we've had no request from a lender. If it's yellow, that says that a lender has requested us for your tax information and we let you know and also it lets us know that that request has happened and that's why it's on a yellow statement. There's also information on the stub that says we've had a request but we can't promise you that they're going to pay it. That's between you and your lender because ultimately the tax is your responsibility. But we do have to send the notice out because it is also a change of value notice. So it's important that everybody gets their bill. So by October, 15th, or October 25th, all the bills are in the mail, and the magic date to get a discount is November the 15th. So if you want to get a full discount and uh, the 3% discount, then we have to have payment received in our office or postmarked by November 15th. On November 16th, all discounts go away and there's interest on the first one-third. If you want to pay the first two-thirds by November 15th, we'll give you a 2% discount, then you pick up the last third by May 15th, or you can make three equal payments November, February, and May 15th. And that's outlined in our insert, and it's also on the back of the statement. Uh, the Board of Property Tax uh, Appeals, or BOPTA as we call it, uh, that right now, uh, because we have mailed our statements, if somebody does have, and remember, you're appealing your real market value, not your tax. Your tax is a calculation. Value times the rate equals the tax. So if you want to appeal your value, those applications are currently available. They're on the website, or you can call our office, and I believe they will also send one out to you. So those filings are due by December 31st, and then the BOPTA board or the Board of Property Tax Appeals does meet uh, in February, and typically they're, they're done in a couple of months. Then June 30th is, is the end of our fiscal year. So right now what's happening is our appraisal department has completed their process for 1314, and now the tax collection office takes over and collects it, and it's six years before we actually would take deed to property. So we're collecting on this for quite a while. But we usually get about 85% of the taxes by November the 15th. Um, <clears throat> And the, when we kind of talked a little bit about the BOPTA board. Now, BOPTA is a, a board of folks just like you that um, want to donate their time, and they, are, they sit on the board. They really aren't part of assessment taxation. They represent you, the people. And so the way that you can address your, an appeal, the first thing would be to go um, to the uh, assessor's office. We recommend that if you look at your tax bill and you have a problem with your market value, call. Because maybe there's something that they can resolve and maybe there was a mistake, uh, maybe the trending uh, in your particular home, maybe there's some issues that needs to have it looked at. So we always recommend that you call first and talk to an appraiser. Then if you, if you still feel that your market value is too high, then the next step would be to file your appeal with BOPTA, or the Board of Property Tax Appeal. And what happens is um, you'll, and it's free, uh, I know for, they were sending out some letters a few years ago, people about paying so much, no, it's a free. You, you just fill it out, uh, you get your data and your information, and remember it's based on January 1 of 2013, and you file that paperwork, and then you can either come to the board uh, in person or you, you don't have to appear if you, you choose not to. Then you will present 
your findings, the county will present their findings, and then the board will make a decision. Uh, if you're not happy with that decision, the next step would be to appeal to the magistrate court, which is in Salem. There is a fee for that. And that's explained to you when you get your appeal uh, from BOPTA. And then, of course, the last one, if you're not happy, would be to go to the Oregon Tax Court. So I'm going to turn it back to Rich. Okay, quickly, what are your property taxes paid for? And of course, police, fire, schools, uh, education, and uh, general government. And again, this year it's about $877 million. That's what we're going to collect on behalf of the, the 49 taxing districts. And uh, how can we help you? We've talked uh, about a few things, but uh, you know, please contact us. Uh, if you have questions about your uh, tax bill that will be coming out, just just give us a call. We'd glad to hear from you, and uh, and we do. We get we get uh, hundreds, if not uh, thousands, of calls. Or you come to check our, our website out. Oops, that little bottom line came out. We have our website on the last. Okay, there's our phone number and our uh, website. So uh, with that, thanks again for uh, asking us. And I guess we'll have time for uh, questions. questions. So line it up on this side, folks. I have a John kind of four member. I have a simple question I'm sure you can answer easily, but could you explain the effects of, tax, of uh, compression on, um, on uh, t taxes, property taxes? Yes. Uh, and we've got uh, Diane. Go ahead and talk sure. about compression. Uh, my favorite subject. <laughs> yeah, the mic loves it too. Um, compression basically has to do with Measure 5. Measure When Measure 50 was passed, Measure 5 um, was still in effect. So what happens when we do calculations on the tax bills, we do two calculations on each and every tax bill. The first one we do is we take, and we're going to talk about education. We actually take the $5 limit that was set by Measure 5 times your market value, and that kind of sets, that sets the bar. That says that this tax account will not pay more to education taxes than this amount. Then we come back through and we do what we call the, the pre-compression calculation, which would be the actual rate that we calculated based on the LB50s and all of the data that we got from the districts, and we multiply that times your assessed value. So if your assessed value is lower than measure 5, then we're going to levy the lower one, which would have been the measure 50 tax. If it happens to be more than measure five, then the difference between the two has to go away. That has to be compressed. So what happens is it hits any local option levies first, and then if there's still more money to compress, then it will go to the other districts and um, take that money away from the district so that the taxpayer is not paying more than $5 times the market value. General government, it is $10 times the market value. And I think we have that. So in this example, it, it shows you how we had a market value of 300000 times the $5. So we're saying that on this particular account, $1,500 is the most they'll pay to education. Then we come back through, and the rate that we actually calculated was four, uh, 6.4258. So we multiply that times their assessed value, which was $250,000. So we're trying to raise 1606.45, but that is $106.45 more than Measure 5 said we could levy. So we go back then and we compress all of the districts that you've seen on that tax bill to make up that $106. Does that answer your question? Do you think a pro rata per category? Per district? Yes. Yes, first we go to the local option levies. 
So let's say there was a local option levy for the school district. In this case, it would have been Tigard School District had a local option levy. Uh, and let's say that the total amount that was being levied was $250. We would take all $106 out of that local option levy and not touch any of the other districts. Once you levy, once you take all of the local option levy, if there's still money left to compress, then it's proportioned between the districts that are left. Does that help? Yeah. Thank you. you okay, and just uh, in context, then last year we had uh, about $9 million in compression, and this year it's about uh, $19 million. So additional $10 million, and most of that's attributable to the Beaverton School District and their local option levy. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, forum member. Thanks all three of you for coming in today. I have two very quick questions. Uh, the first one is during the recent recession, the value of my property went down. So I want to know if my taxes might have gone down too. My wife pays it, so I'm not sure, you know, the numbers, but I was just curious about that. And my second question is, uh, would you talk a little bit about the uh, exemption for, or the, you know, the discount for uh, disabled veterans? Okay, the first question is uh, about values. And um, just looking at the real market value, the average real market value of a home in this county was 340000 back in in uh, 2007. That real market value dropped uh, in uh, 2012 down to 262000 So there was a, a drop in real market value over time. But what you didn't see, you didn't see a drop in your, your tax bill because as we explained, your assessed value, of course, is determined by the lower of your, your real market value or your maximum assessed value. But your, the, the uh, real market value was still above your maximum assessed value, so your taxes went up 3%. So that was the question we got for the last five years. How in the heck can my taxes go up when my real market value is going yeah. down? And that's the reason why. This year, the real market value of, of uh, an average home in our county went from uh, 262000 to 280000 this year. So it was about a 7% increase. So... As you saw in that atypical example, we're going to have some homes in this area or in our county where even though uh, their their tax bill will go up 7-8% and most of that will be due to the real market value uh, uh, going up more than, um, well, the assessed value is based on the real market value and the real market value is going up so the tax bill will go up because it's it, it, the assessed value did go up by 7%. Does that make sense on that question? Okay, the second question was, is uh, an exemption amount for veterans? Um, the disabled veterans exemption is by application. Those applications are accepted between January 1st and I believe April the 15th, but I won't swear to that, it could be April 1st. You need to be 40% service disabled. If you are the widow of a veteran, then you would automatically um, qualify as long as you hadn't remarried. And what we would be looking for for that application would be the uh, death certificate, discharge papers, and, and the marriage certificate. It's a value reduction of your assessed value. And I, to be honest with you, I don't have the exact amount, but I can tell you that it calculates out to about a $300 savings on your tax bill. It's an exemption that's never paid back. Uh, if you sell the home or if, uh, if it's a widow of a veteran and you remarry, then you would not qualify. But if you sell the home and you purchase another one, you'd have to requalify for the new home. But as far as your disability, it does have to be 40% service connected and there'll be um, documents that they'll need from your uh, doctor stating that. But if you want to call our office, like I say, all the numbers are on the tax bill in our insert. We'd be happy to talk to you if you think it's a program that you qualify for, because we sure want to get you signed up for it. Uh, John Putzler, former member. <clears throat> I think I understand the um, explanation of compression, but I have another question in regard to that. Um, my sense is that there are certain taxpayers in the county who, um, who can vote for a new tax or a tax increase that would have no effect on their own taxes because they're 
property is in compression. Is that correct? Is that how compression would work? And and if so, how how does a taxpayer um, how does a taxpayer learn that they're in that circumstance when they're being asked to vote? That in in essence they can vote for a tax increase, which would be an increase on their Washington County neighbors, but not on themselves. Well, what we do in, in uh, Washington County, of course, is we follow the Oregon Revised Statutes and the rules that support them. Um, so all we're doing is we're just we're just administering the uh, the process according to the statute. In in this case, we're especially in the Beaverton School District, we'll have some properties that were never in compression. So this is the first year that they will experience compression and. Uh, for most taxpayers, they wouldn't know that unless they called called us, and uh, we would have to explain that to them. So there'd be some homes in Beaverton where, if you took a look at it, the real market value may have gone up, let's say, 12%, and um, your assessed value went up 3%, but your tax bill only went up 7%. Um, the, the reduction, you may think, well, why didn't it go up 12% or, or the 3%? Well, a lot of that's due to compression, where we tried to get maybe 12%, but uh, we, we couldn't because of compression. Um, we track about 100 homes on our, our press release, and each one's different. I'll talk about my home. My home, my value went up 12%. I'm in the Beaverton School District. My assessed value went up 3%. My home's not subject to compression. So my tax bill went up 12 percent. It was all tr attributable to the Beaverton School Local Option Levy, the Metro Local Option Levy, and then a little bit of the uh, the AV growth, the 3 percent AV growth. So it really depends on where you are now. Now to go ahead and calculate, if I vote, what will happen? It's a property by property test, and, and that's what makes it so difficult for for me to to. Uh, tell you, I, I would have to look at your property and then have to do kind of a calculation next year. Yeah. If you pass this, what impact will that have on compression to your home? Right, I understand. So, <clears throat> and so if I understand, it's not, it's not really possible for, for an individual taxpayer who's, who's uh, facing a vote on a new tax to determine, for example, from his last year's tax statement how that will affect his taxes? No, because what could happen is I don't. I we we don't have any. Uh, we don't have a staff economist uh, at our department. So what we, you would have to know, you would have to know exactly how much is the value of your home going to go up on one one fourteen, and we don't know that okay. because the compression test, of course, is going to be based upon that value. So if the values go up, let's say another 7% or 10%, your home that was in compression this year can go out of compression. Do, do you see what I mean? And it, yes. it, it, it is an account by account. So it's, so it's, some, it's not something that's likely to, to influence elections. It's really something, it, it's really a circumstance that comes as a surprise when you get your next tax bill as to whether your taxes went up as much as... Or, or could go down, or, yeah, or, or, down. Could, or could go down because now you're in compression and you didn't pay the full amount of the local option levy. Thank you. That, that, very good question, thank you. Kathy Stanton, a forum member of all that. The last two, I probably have 17 questions. <laughs> um, I will only ask one. Um, if. How would I find out why local options get hit first with compression? Because I find it very disconcerting that the, one of the few things that we actually get to vote on anymore as a property owner, local options are the first um, that's going to take a hit with compression. Uh, again, and, and what we do in Washington County, it's, it's just a matter of following the order. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. So ORS what? Do you have the... Uh, you know, I, I don't, if you would like that I'll, specific I'll get, I'll get, I'll get it from you. Yeah, I can uh, go back to the office and look it up, but it is, is prescribed by statute, and it may even be part of uh, the Constitution, but that's the way it happens. Oh, crap. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Harry Bodine, Harry Bodine, for a member. Uh, 
two related questions. We have a countywide library levy passed in 2010 for 17 cents per thousand. We've had a relatively flat growth in valuation in this county since 20, 2007. So the libraries have not received that much more money every year with the, even though the assessed value has increased. This year, as I understand, we've got a whole bunch of additional property coming online, much more so than in past years. So question number one is, well, did the libraries expect to receive a lot more money this year on the basis of what Intel's adding and residential values are adding than we've seen in recent years? Are we going to see a real bump in revenue is what I'm asking? The, uh, the real market value of the county did, did increase. Um, we had about uh, 68 billion last year, and it's up to the, about 76 uh, billion this year. And a lot of that was due to um, about three million just in market appreciation. Uh, One billion to exception events that we talked about, uh, adding new houses, uh, adding on to existing structures. And then a significant amount was uh, from the Intel investment. For, that was the real market value increase. But we've also talked that, that the amount of taxes generated is based on your, your assessed value. So the assessed value in the county increased 3.7%. Um, just taking a look at the, the county, or the, the library system countywide, I believe we're going to get about a 3% um, increase in AV, and I'd have to take a look at uh, the actual um, we call it the the 4A, which we're, we're still working working on. That talks about how much did their how much value did they have times their rate, and then we have to take out things like uh, compression loss and, and and other things like that to, to find out the exact amount. But I think it was around a three percent for uh, for library. Thank you very much. Question number. This is related, folks. Compression. What's this going to do? The 17 cents per thousand. Well, compression again is a property by property uh, test, and libraries will be on the general government side. So we'll have to take a look at, at uh, any place where the, the rate exceeded the $10 per thousand on the general government side, and then do a property by property test to see if, if uh, any of those amounts, or where we tried to, to get more than $10 then we'd have to compress. So it's a property by property <clears throat> test. Thank you. Anybody, Eric? Yes, I'm coming in. Change places. You can do that. Eric Squires, forum member. In the 1970s, the band The Spinners had a famous song called Games People Play. I would ask each one of you to tell me a little bit about. Um, the issues you've had at the tax counter with citizens, for example, I want to pay in chickens or, or uh, <laughs> pennies or uh, alternate currencies or just uh, you know some of the experiences that you could publicly share about uh, the public and their interface with the, uh, the tax system in Washington County. Okay, we'll start off with uh, chickens? the forms of payment. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you asked that. I happen to have our policy right here. We actually have a policy that we uh, have at the counter. We don't take chickens. We don't take a lot of coins. We don't take a lot of dollar bills. Uh, uh, it, we have in the past, when people have come in uh, with stacks of fives, tens, and twenties, uh, asked them to please go to the bank and come back with larger form of, of uh, dollars. Or, we it hasn't been busy, I have two people that would uh, count it once and then the person would count it again so everybody in line would have to wait for this gentleman or person. Uh, now we have a cash counting machine so if you want to come in with a wheelbarrow full of ones, if it's not busy I probably would take it but you're going to have to wait while it goes through the machine. Uh, we take um, personal or business checks. We actually take a credit or debit card which is subject to a convenience fee. Of course, we like cash, but in manageable formats. Uh, we don't take post-dated checks. We don't take public money certificates. We don't take large amounts of coins like pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters. Uh, 
And we also occasionally will ask for cashier's check if you're paying for certain things like a plat where you're having to prepay some taxes. We will insist, or if it's in foreclosure, that you bring a certified check. But other than that, uh, yeah, we've had some interesting uh, people come in. We've had people come in that had a stack of $1 bills, uh, but... Uh, they, we've asked them to go back and bring us some larger coins, but this is posted at our counter, so if you come in to see us, you will see this there. <laughs> I'm Emily Knapp. I'm a member. Um, how old and how poor do you have to be to get your taxes deferred? Okay. <laughs> okay. See your deferral. You have to be 62 years of ages or old, uh, 62 year or, uh, of ages or older. Uh, you also, if you are disabled and on SSI, you can also qualify for the senior disabled uh, exemption. You do need to know, or deferral, it is a deferral. There is an application period. The fund, and I'm sure that you've heard a lot about it in the news, was um, on the verge of collapsing a couple of years ago, and the legislature went in and had to make some real major cuts in order to keep the program uh, up and running, and we actually had uh, probably really close to 50% of Washington County residents that no longer qualify. But you have to have uh, an income limit, which I believe is around $40,000. Uh, probably in our insert as well talks about that. Application is uh, January 1st through April the 15th. You have to have lived in your home for five years. It cannot be a reverse mortgage. You have to have be within the medium value, uh, and I'm not sure that we've determined that yet for the next application. Uh, let's see, five years, medium value, income limit. They also are going to look at your, your assets or your values. So they've really limited the, the program to those folks that really need to be on it. So once again, we do have flyers at the office that can explain exactly. It is just a deferral if the deferral is disqualified because of death or if you move from the property or sell it, it will have to be paid back and the interest was changed from 6% simple to 6% compound. So there, and I know that uh, revert, you cannot have a reverse mortgage. So that was a big big thing. So we do have the applications. We do have some great uh, brochures about it. So please call us and we'd be happy to send that out to you if you think you qualify. Chris Leslie, forum member. This is maybe a little off the track again, but uh, the huge amount of apartments and tenements that have been built what is their property tax base compared to the individual homeowners? Or do they pay assessed value? They've been sitting empty for so long. Is there uh, anything you can talk about that? Um, what same same uh, system? They'll they'll pay on their assessed value, which is the lower their real market value or their maximum assessed value times the rate that's in there. How do you assess the value on an apartment building? Uh, real market value on an apartment building? Uh, we just follow the, the Oregon Revised Statute. We can either use the uh, it's the cost approach, the income approach, or or the sales comparison approach. For apartment buildings, we normally just use the income approach, standard in the industry, and uh, that's how we arrive at uh, real market value on our apartment complexes. And we have about. Uh, about $2 billion in value in the county on apartment complexes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Harry Boudin in compression one last time. <clears throat> when I was in earlier life, I was a newspaper reporter, and when I retired, there were about two areas of Washington County that were under compression. One was the city of Portland, which levies a lot of taxes. The other was the city of Gaston, where there's no value, or very little value. <laughs> so my, my question to you is, how much of the county now is underneath compression? What's, what's your percentage, county-wide, would you guess? The, uh, the number of accounts that were in compression we're about 50,000 last year, and this year it'll it'll drop down to about 40,000. But you have to understand, can you bring up that chart that's got the atypical property? Can you do that? 
I'm going to bring up the chart that's the atypical. Because you have, have to understand that uh, we have about 26,000 accounts that are personal property. And personal property is like a table, uh, business personal property. You know, table, computers. And uh, so a business will buy that. And let's say you pay $100 for the table, and we'll put it on a schedule, and next year it may be worth $90. So the real market value of that table is now $90, but the maximum assessed value is $100. And the assessed value is the lower of the two, so the assessed value is now 90 And if you're in an area where you can compress the um, on your personal property tax bill, it, it'll compress because it'll try to get, let's say, six dollars uh, per thousand on that assessed value, and the limit's five dollars on your real market value, and it, and it's the same number, so you're going to lose about a dollar per thousand just on on those personal property accounts. And here it is, just say for example, um, using this. Um, let's say we bought uh, personal property up around 190,000 and it just starts dropping. So as you get down to that line, you see where your real market value is your assessed value and it'll compress. So that's what's happening. And again, it's, it's property by property. So a lot of accounts that weren't in compression last year are in compression this year. Other accounts that were in compression last year are not in compression this year. And uh, some that are in compression are still in compression, but not as, as much. So it, it's really account by account. And what we did is we, we really looked in detail on our, um, our press release. We track 100 accounts. And we looked at each 100 accounts. And there's a different story. Uh, for example, my account again. Real market value went up 12%. Sess value went up 3%. No compression, tax bill went 12%. Right down the street from me. Now you're in this, I'm in unincorporated Washington County, not in the city of Beaverton. Go right down the street from me, a property owner in the city of Beaverton. They weren't compression last year. Real market value went up about 10% or about 12%. Assessed value uh, went up. 3%. Uh, or with, because of compression, their uh, taxes only went up 7%. Go out here to Hillsboro. There was no school local option levy, but you had an account <coughs> like this where the real market value went up 12%. The assessed value went up 7 or 8%. So the taxes went up 7 8 it, it just depends. Another one I pulled was out in uh, an area where there was uh, no school, no, uh, no metro increase. And there was actually a little bit of decrease in their bonded uh, uh, rate. So, you know, value went up, tax bill went, or uh, the tax bill did not go up 3%, it went up about 2.5%. Did you see what I mean? It's just, a, it's just a count by account. And if you have any questions about your tax bill, though, please call us because we may have to go in and take a look at the detail. And we'd be more than happy to explain it to you. Okay. I'm curious, Patrick, we had a farm member. I'm curious on, with fire, fire and police services and school districts are the biggest ones that go out for levies. And if you're going to come out with a uh, levy this year, you know, go before the voters and whatnot, can they come to you and say, you know, we want to go out for a $500,000 levy, but, you know, it's good through compression, you're only going to get maybe 250000 for example. Do you advise the different municipalities or different agencies going out, like, what they can expect on compression, or are they just kind of sailing out thinking they're going to get so much money and that's it? Um, again, you really need to have a, a staff economist, and we do not have an economist on staff. And I'm asked this question all the time 
from the, uh, the taxing districts. And what we can do, though, is we have a, a very large database, and we provide that database to that taxing district. And then the taxing district will then have to make their own projections. I can tell you, if you take a look at the voters' pamphlet for the Beaverton local option levy, last year, before the voters, they were hoping to raise about $15 million. And, and, this, year, and this year, even with the compression loss, they, they did raise uh, that amount plus a little bit. So I don't know if they used an economist or not, but we do not provide that. Chris Leslie, form member again. The assessed value for uh, Hillsboro is like 41 cents for an education, education uh, 906, 206, something like that. Uh, but Lake Oswego has a reoccurring uh, tax levy of $1.39 per thousand assessed value. Why is the great difference between these assessed value uh, costs? I don't have the answer to that right now. I'd have to go back into the uh, summary book I, to find out what the uh, exact rates are. We have the rates that's published. Um, we have all the, the historical uh, rates on our website. I'd have to go back in and look at the, the, the rate that the, the school district of Hillsboro <laughs> Uh, has, and then compared that, but we have all that data, uh, historical. Even the, it's a reoccurring levy that was first 2000, uh, in the year 2000. Are you talking about probably their permanent rate? Uh, a reoccurring levy that... Uh, a local option levy? Yes, for Lake Oswego. For, it was 2000, 2006, 2004, 2008. And 2013, they skipped 2012. But why is that levy? Does that keep going up? I'd have to do some research to answer that question. I, I'm okay. thinking what, what we may be seeing is the um, they're they're taking a, a five-year local option levy to the voters each uh, five years for approval, and it's up to the voters to approve that that levy. So. It might have started out as 41, like Hillsboro, and then got up. I'd have to I'd have to do some research on that, but yeah, yeah it would go out on the voters' pamphlet, and it'd say, "This is how much uh, we want to go out," and then it'd go to the voters, and then the, the voters approved it. Then it would be implemented. Mm -hmm. Last question. Uh, Lee Coleman for a member. Uh, the three percent annual increase. That is optional, isn't it? Uh, it is not mandatory. So the question is, how often has the county um, not opted to increase the full 3%? The 3%, again, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people think that uh, my taxes can only go up 3% and that's not true. because. What happens is, is your, your taxes are based upon your assessed value times a rate. And as we've talked about in this slide, uh, your assessed value is based on the lower of your real market value or your maximum assessed value. Can you go back to this? Well, the question is about how often the county has opted to go the full 3%. Uh, well, they, there's, there's, all it is, it's just statute driven. Uh, we take the well, is it mandatory? A 3% increase? That's the question. I don't... It's up to 3%. Up to, so it's optional. No, it's not optional. So how often maybe is the county... Maybe the question talking. again is, how often has the county uh, ignored the 3% limit and, and opted for no increase or a less lesser amount in percentage? Yeah, I don't have an answer to that question. I'll have to, I'll have to research that. But, but according to um, how the statutes work is each year they're going to get a, 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 a value increase that could be greater or less than 3%. And then we apply that to the rate and that's how the taxes are calculated.
Folks, how about a hand for our great great presenters? I'd like to wind down today's meeting with just a reminder that we have WashingtonCountyForum.org as a place where you can find information including upcoming schedules. You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter and you can look at historical programs such as uh, Pavel Goberman as 2,500 other people have online whereas uh, you know other speakers like Ted Wheeler only got 90 hits. And I'm just kind of wondering why this popularity contest is so bewildering on our website. WashingtonCountyForum.org is uh, a great place where you can do historical research and look at all the past presidents and uh, find other information. Uh, I'd also like to extend a plea to the forum members that we are looking for volunteers to do stuff such as uh, uh, production and I want to also thank uh, people who show up early like Joseph Tyner. Uh, as someone who goes to a lot of meetings we have a sound system, we have lights, we have a TV camera and it takes a lot of energy to make that happen. Joseph does an amazing job. And to conclude the meeting I would ask that you uh, give some, Joseph some applause. He does a great job. See you in a week, folks.